Hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to this edition of She's Got Gall, the podcast series presented to you by the Georgia Association for Women Lawyers. And I am Ebony Phillips, your host. I am super, super thrilled. We are in our Women Trailblazers series. It is a series that we are formally calling She Was the First, Conversations with Women Trailblazers. And it is dynamic because we have a very, 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 and I can't say very enough times to adequately cover it, a very, very, very impactful and trailblazing group of women who we're going to be bringing to you as individual guests on the series. And our hope really is that, of course, we want to showcase and highlight all the wonderful work that they've done um, for our profession, but also that you will find some nuggets of wisdom and advice and inspiration for whatever that next thing is that you might feel like you want to do. And I am very honored because we have the pleasure of having with us tonight, attorney Linda Klein. And I want to give her a prop. Hey, Linda, I want to give her a proper introduction. And then we will um, set out to talk about all the wonderful things that she's done and is doing for the profession. Um, But just so you know, Linda Klein is Senior Managing Shareholder at Baker Donaldson and is past president of the American Bar Association. Ms. Klein is also listed in the Best Lawyers in America, Who's Who in America and Chambers, USA, Best Lawyers in America. Recently recognized Ms. Klein as Atlanta's Lawyer of the Year in Arbitration. She is regularly named to the Super Lawyers Top 100 Lawyers in Georgia and is also regularly named one of the top 50 female lawyers in Georgia by super lawyers. In 2018, she was chosen attorney of the year by the Daily Report. In 1998, following her term as the first woman to serve as president of the State Bar of Georgia, Georgia Trend Magazine named her one of the 100 most powerful and influential Georgians. Ms. Klein is a past president for the American Bar Association, also known as the ABA, and that is the world's largest voluntary excuse me, Voluntary Professional Association. Let me go over that again. The world's largest, okay? Voluntary Professional Association. She previously served as chair of the ABA's House of Delegates, the association's policymaking body. She also served as chair of the tort trial and insurance practice section, chair of the committee on rules and calendar of the House of Delegates, chair of the Coalition for Justice, and chair of ABA Day the association's congressional outreach effort. She is a recent member of the Council of the ABA Section of International Law and also served as a columnist and on the board of editors of Law Practice Management Magazine. In 2013, Ms. Klein had the honor of being a McLaughlin Fellow on the campuses of William and Mary Business and Law Schools. She delivered the commencement addresses at Atlanta's John Marshall College of Law in 2018, Georgia State University College of Law 2017, Cleveland Marshall College of Law 2017, Pepperdine University School of Law 2016, and Washington and Lee University School of Law in 2012. In 2009, Ms. Klein was honored with the Randolph Thrower Award for Lifetime Achievement and was named to the YWCA Academy of Women Achievers. In 2004, the American Bar Association honored Ms. Klein with the prestigious Margaret Brent Achievement Award. President Jimmy Carter appointed Ms. Klein to the Carter Center Board of Counselors for the 2019-2022 term. She also currently serves on the Board of Directors of the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce and the Presidential Precinct and Executive Committee of the Buckhead Coalition and on the Advisory Board of Super Lawyers. She is a past president of the South Face Energy Institute, the Board of Directors Network, the Caucus of State Bars, and past chair of both the Institute for Continuing Legal Education in Georgia and the Lawyers Foundation of Georgia. She also served a six-year term on Baker Donaldson's Board of Directors. Ms. Klein has authored numerous published works. Her lecture schedule has included presentations in France, Poland, Sweden, Spain, Russia, Croatia, Japan, Great Britain, and Canada, but most extensively in the Southeast United States. She is a member of the American Law Institute and a mediator and arbitrator, frequently serving as a neutral as well as a client advocate. Please help me welcome trailblazer, attorney Linda Klein. Hello, hello. Thank you so much. It's just, I've been a member of Golf 
I guess my whole professional life. So I'm excited to be part of this uh, series. So thank you very much for including me. Absolutely. We're so glad you're here. I was uh, sort of trying to think about how the conversation today would go. And I thought, you know, that word trailblazer is thrown around quite a bit, but what, what really is a trailblazer? And so I started looking at different pieces and and the like. And one of the things that came along was, uh, that popped up was a trailblazer is a person who is paving the way in their particular field for future generations. And I think we often probably think about the fact that trailblazers are leaving a, a path, certainly, but the, the future generations part is what kind of just really, really stuck with me because certainly you've done a lifetime full already and you're not done yet. We know that. Um, but what you do will impact future generations. But that also got me thinking somebody who's done that much and that level of, and has had that level of impact must have had somebody that they look to. Like who, who would you say is a woman trailblazer that you admired? A uh, Carol Hunstein. Mm. She she was the second woman to serve on the Georgia Supreme Court, the first woman to chair the Council of Superior Court Judges, and the winner of the most highly challenged campaign for re-election to the Georgia Supreme Court in absolutely Georgia judicial history. So she's the who. But why? The why is that she is fearless. Mm. She had a very, very difficult young life. She lost her mother when she was 12. She spends months at a, at a time as a teenager in the hospital. And I once asked her, I said, why are you the only one in your family to even go to college, much less law school? And she told me that when she was in the hospital for months at a time, her mother was gone and uh, children, her sisters weren't allowed to visit her because children weren't allowed to come to the hospital in, in those days. And she right. said her own, the only people who came to visit her were the doctors and nurses. And they told wow. her education was important. Uh, wow. Later was a young single mother uh, and was able to uh, use programs provided by the, the state of Florida that helped her uh, get a job and helped her uh, uh, get her education while she was caring for her son as a single mother. And then eventually she was able to go to law school. Uh, one other reason why she's fearless is when she ran for judge in DeKalb County, it was a five-way race. She was the only woman. Uh, she made the runoff, but she came in a distant second, but she made the runoff. And her opponent was so positive that he was going to win. He went on vacation. Are you serious? Instead of campaigning. Yes. Wow. He, he campaigned and she worked really hard and she won. <laughs> That's an incredible, incredible story. But I've just never heard, maybe I'm just naive. But I've just never heard of anyone going on vacation in the middle of a campaign. Well, I mean, like, wow. He did, and she outworked him. That, and, yeah. and, and then she was appointed to chair the Child Support Commission, I think, three times. She got death threats. Oh, that's in, terrible. In 2006, when she had that difficult campaign, she was outspent four to one, and she still carried every county in Georgia. Nothing scares her. She That's tells it amazing. like she sees it. Tough judge. But when she was a judge, she was a tough judge. She's retired now, but she was a fair judge. That's amazing. I interned at the Georgia Supreme Court for a little bit, and she was down there, um, you know, still on the bench when I was down there. And I, 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 can, I didn't know her backstory, obviously, because I was just an intern. But the other things that you've said about her, I, I could totally understand and see for myself. So I could see why she would be who you would look up to. And so I'm a person who kind of, um, one little quirky thing about me is that I love quotes, right? And so um, one of the quotes that I came across says, um, people who end up as first don't actually set out to be first. They set out to do something they love. And that is a quote from Condoleezza Rice, right? And I thought, well, yeah, because I hear people saying all the time, if you love your job, you love your work, then you never work a day in your life and so on and so forth. And I don't know necessarily that everybody has found that or if that's true for everybody. You know what I mean? Like, so we know that you are the first woman president of the State Bar of Georgia, which is, I mean, had to be a climb 
a tremendous climb, right? Um, and it's not something that every woman could do, right? It's, I mean, you know, if we're just being transparent about it, but I kind of wonder, like with a climb like that and all it would have taken to do that and achieve that, like, did you set out to be the first woman president of the state bar of Georgia or did it kind of happen some other way and you had to dive and you diverted to, to that position? Like what happened? Tell us a story. So the, the, the quote that you, Condoleezza Rice's quote is absolutely true. I, I didn't set out. Um, I moved to Atlanta. I had gone to law school in Virginia. I didn't know anybody here really. And so I got involved in the Atlanta Council of Younger Lawyers just to make friends, to meet other people. Mm -hmm. uh, I was appointed to the board of directors of the Atlanta Council of Younger Lawyers. And at that, the first meeting, the chair uh, was handing out the jobs that everybody on the board was going to do that year. And he was handing out this job that was very boring and nobody wanted it. So everybody was looking <laughs> because nobody kind of wanted to make eye board. contact because <laughs> they didn't want the job that nobody wanted. Right, right. So I, he said, and Linda will, I was like, oh gosh, <laughs> but I did the job and I did yeah. it well. Yeah. And the, the fruits of my labor were published in the Atlanta bars magazine, which used to be a printed magazine. It's now an mm -hmm. online magazine, still excellent publication. And that was read by the chair of the state bars committee uh, on the same topic. Wow. And he called me an elder statesman, uh, Ben Weinberg, the firm Weinberg Wheeler is there's his name. And he called me and he said, I'm the chair of this committee and I would like to republish your article in the state bar journal. And I, I mean, I was a young lawyer. I was like, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> and then he decided that he was going to move on from being the chair of that state bar committee. Mm -hmm. And he suggested to the state bar president that he appoint me as chair of the committee to succeed him. Wow. And so one thing led to another. I, I took on that job. And then he called me and he said, I'm not going to stand for reelection to my board of governor seat. I think you should do it. And I ran for the state bar board of governors. It was a contested race mm -hmm. against mm -hmm. the former chair of the state bar young lawyer section. So somebody who was more well-known than I sure. was. Sure. But just like Carol Hunstein campaigning really hard, mm -hmm. I, I ran an endorsement campaign and, 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 and sent letters around and I won. And then okay. after I, so I was elected to the seat on the board of governors, I have fairly young lawyer and I made friends at, at the board of governors meetings and there was an open seat on the executive committee and I just decided to run and I won. Wow. That's that's pretty incredible, though. I mean, just the way that all of those things lined up, and then so, right, you see opportunity, and yeah. take it, and just take it, just take it. Wow. But so we were kind of talking about you becoming the first president of the state bar of Georgia, um, and a first woman president. Let me correct that. But there there had been all these men who done it before, like every other time it had been a man. Um, and so when that happened, did you find that there was like any kind of added professional pressure or added scrutiny after you became the first pr woman president of the state bar of Georgia? And um, so how did you handle that? So you just reminded me of a video shoot that I did congratulating my friend and another person I greatly admire, the first woman on the Georgia Supreme Court, the first woman chief justice of the Georgia Supreme Court, Leah Ward Sears. And I recall mm -hmm. doing this video and saying about her in the video that when you are first, you have to be perfect. And, and she mm. was. And when you are first, you have to be perfect so that there is a second and a 70 second. It's on your yeah. shoulder. Wow. So how, how did I handle that is your question. And I, I woke up every day and I tried to do my best. As a young woman lawyer, I was usually the one woman and right. I had to outwork the men. So it was really nothing different because I knew that there needed to be a second and a 72nd. Right. So 
work hard, make a difference. But there's something much more important I want to tell you about how I handle being the first woman president of the State Bar of Georgia. And I'm told this, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I was told at the time that I appointed more women and lawyers of color to bar committees than all of my predecessors combined. Wow. And we brought bars of color together to share ideas with each other and to learn who at the state bar could help them. And we met with uh, Georgia Legal Services and Atlanta Legal Aid to see how we could help them help our less fortunate neighbors. Right, right. So when you're first, this is your chance to set an example and you take that chance. Mm. Diversity was important to me. So I shouted it out in my Yeah, life. yeah, yeah. That is incredible and, and, and very inspiring because sometimes I think when people get in positions, it's kind of like all about them because now they've arrived and they've climbed the mountain. But to hear you saying how you appointed um, all the different people and brought all the different people together, I think that's very admirable. And I think that's a great example for, for other women lawyers to follow. Um, you, you know, when you have a position like this, you're president of the state bar, you're president of the American Bar Association or whatever it is, there's a lot of people that uh, tell you just how great you are. But, right, right, but right, right. it's not really what this is about. Don't take the position if you don't want to do something special with it. You, mm. It's not about you. It's about, this is a nonprofit organization. It's about right. making a difference. Right, right. So in thinking about that and in thinking about sort of all the experience that you've had and all the different experiences that you've had and all the, like, you, you've had a number of leadership positions and they, they are very diverse from just, you know, reading your bio. What advice do you have for other women? I mean, there is somebody that's going to be watching this on our YouTube channel or listening to this on Spotify. And they're thinking, man, Linda Klein is really, really special. Linda Klein has done a lot for the profession. I want to make that kind of impact. What advice would you give for women who want to be the first of, you know, of something? Work hard. Mm -hmm. Be the best. Get to be known for keeping your word and doing good work. Um, be present and impress a lot of people with your responsiveness and your competence. Re mm. Responsive is very important. So when you say um, your responsiveness, can you elaborate on that a little bit? I would say that people can bear anything except being ignored. Okay. And okay. so if someone calls you emails you get back to them yeah don't yeah. don't ignore people i mean if you have to say no to someone just say no i know it's sometimes it's uncomfortable but if that's right. what you have to do no is the second best answer sometimes someone can get because then yeah. they know they can move on right so i highly recommend being responsive so we were um talking about the Bar Association and how you were the first woman president. And I thought about it. Like, I don't know all the fine line details of the history. My, you know, my recollection is that the State Bar of Georgia replaced um, the Georgia Bar Association in 1964. And to my understanding, that organization was founded in 1884 and so there were not any women presidents of the state bar of georgia before you did it and there doesn't seem like there were any women presidents of the georgia bar association um and so whether we're talking about the hundred or so years between 1996 and and 1884 or whether we're talking about the 30 something years between 1996 and 1964, I don't want us to just kind of gloss over sort of how momentous um, it was for you to kick that door down for other women um, to follow. And since and since you kicked it in, we have had other, other women presidents who've, who've been able to follow in your footsteps. But 
Can you talk a little bit about that? I think that's important to highlight. Like, I don't want to just gloss over it. So the Georgia Bar Association was a voluntary um, white men only bar association. And it wasn't until 1964 when we had a unified bar. Uh, the main reason for the unified bar was really uh, lawyer discipline mm -hmm. so that lawyer discipline could be gathered within the bar and then reported to the Georgia Supreme Court. Before that, the district attorney would be the one involved in lawyer discipline. Oh, so wow. there was a good reason to unify the bar under the leadership and uh, of the and governance of the Georgia Supreme Court. But and so until 1964, it basically was a segregated white men's only club. Uh, mm. I, there may, I, I do not know when the first woman to, licensed to practice law in Georgia came about, but I do know that there were debates about it in this Georgia Bar Association. And somewhere in the archives at the state bar, there are the, uh, the proceedings. And someone said we should admit women to the bar. And then someone else stood up and said, if a woman is ever born with proclivities to the law, she should marry a lawyer and load the cannon so he can fire it. Oh my, oh my, I just, that gave me chills and not in a good way. <laughs> That's so terrible. That's so terrible. But I think that really just underscores the importance of what you accomplished really um, and what you did for women in the profession. Um, because we know that, like I said, there have been other um, women presidents of the state bar now that you've actually blazed that trail. Um, oh, and the first person of color uh, to be president of the state bar was a woman, Patrice Perkins Hooker. Yes, yes. We, we, so we owe you a lot. <laughs> we, we, we do. I mean, and I'll say it. I know you would never say it, but I'll say it. We do. I mean, because had you not done that, we might still be trying to, you know, quash the debates that you just mentioned um, and those theories about how a woman needs to attach herself to a man to really uh, move forward. That is, that's chilling. Um, so we look at people like yourself, um, whom we admire, and somebody said, and again, I'm just a person that loves quotes, um, you see my glory, but you don't know my story. And so when we see you up there getting sworn in for this thing or that thing, and you're getting this plaque and that plaque, there's a backstory, I'm sure. You know, there are probably more backstory than you can share on this little podcast here. But I wonder um, if you could share with the audience, like what was the most re rewarding part of, becoming the first but then also in that same vein you know what was the most challenging part about it well um i would say that when i i the i, I ran statewide to become secretary of the state bar in 1994 okay and i drove all over georgia and asked lawyers for their vote. I put 6,600 miles on my Oldsmobile, driving all <laughs> that's, over. Georgia, that's a lot. Asking <laughs> lawyers for their vote. And I I was fortunate to be elected. Um, and in, in fact, my election made the National Law Journal. There were all kinds of things that went on in the campaign. And, um, I, I, I won't go into that, uh, but I, one day if we have more time, we can talk about that. But when I was elected the first woman statewide officer of the State Bar of Georgia, I started it, it, it made the it made the news because mm -hmm. uh, in Georgia, there are one hundred and fifty nine counties. Only Texas has more counties than Georgia. And yeah, every yeah. county needs a county newspaper, the legal organ for the county to put in all the legal notices. Right, and right. so the story got picked up all over the state. And what happened next really changed my life because I got phone calls from women who were the victims of domestic violence. Wow. And they read about this first woman officer of the state bar and they were, they, they felt invisible because mm. they would go to Georgia legal services for help, but because there had been budget cuts, the Georgia legal services could only help about 25% of the people who came to see them. Oh, that's terrible. 
And this broke my heart. I had to do something to help these women. And remember, I just gone all over the state and right, the right, schoolers all over the state. They they helped me get elected, and so I had these friends and I started making phone calls. And they said to me, Linda, we'll take five pro bono cases for you so long as one of them is not domestic violence. And they had legitimate reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, the 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 perpetrator of the domestic violence had shown up at their office or shown up at their child's school, particularly in smaller towns where everyone knows everyone. And it was very difficult. But the lawyers for Georgia Legal Services, they're fearless. Mm -hmm. And this is what they do. So right. I had to find a way for them to get more resources so they could help more people. So we came up with this idea that we would ask the Georgia legislature to use tax dollars to help the indigent victims of domestic violence get the lawyers they needed. Now, wow. remember, historically, people believe that, that Georgia doesn't fully fund what they're required to fund constitutionally in indigent criminal defense. Right. And we were asking the Georgia legislature to use tax dollars to fund civil legal services, but just for the indigent victims of domestic violence, this unique group that was so needy. Mm -hmm. And so we put together a coalition of 66 community organizations. Uh, we went to the General Assembly. Um, Chief Justice Benham at the time was helpful. Attorney, uh, attorney, the Attorney General uh, Thurber Baker was very helpful at the time. And we asked for $2 million from the state legislature. We did political polling to prove that 80% of Georgia, no matter how you split the demographic, thought that this was a good use of their tax dollars. And so we went to the legislature, we asked for the $2 million, we told them we would help 4,000 families with $2 million. Um, let's just say it was hard fought, but we got the whole $2 million. Wow. We didn't help 4,000 families, we helped 6,000 families the first year. That's amazing. Think about how efficient legal services lawyers are with the money that we give them. So right. Georgia became I one of the first 10 states in the nation to give any money for civil legal services. Now, 49 states give taxpayer dollars for Georgia legal services. So it was it was incredible. And it still is money that is given by the legislature every year. And so many people are helped. So that was the most rewarding part of the journey. You are like always blazing a trail of some sort and being innovative and all the things, right? Um, and what about, did you want to speak on any challenges or the challenging part you think? Well, that, it, it was challenging. It was challenging yeah. to run the campaign. Sure. It was challenging to help these women get the, the assistance they need. And it right. was certainly challenging to navigate the legislature to get them to do something that was absolutely unprecedented in Georgia and in most states of the country. Well, so I will say this. I thought that I was impressed and totally inspired before our conversation, just by all that I had come to know about you. But this conversation has me really kind of thinking about the profession and, and being innovative in ways that I don't think I had thought about before. So I have to thank you face to face for that because um, sometimes we can get caught up in doing things the way that they've always been done. And we wouldn't think of something, you know, that probably was so out of the box when you all came up with it to solve a very, um, a very big problem and a problem that was solvable with the right innovations and the right um, the right processes in place. I am thrilled that you came by. Um, this has been, you know, very eye-opening for me. And I hope that our listeners and our audience have gotten as much out of the conversation as I have. Um, this conversation will be played on Spotify and Spotify distributes out to Anchor FM, Apple Podcasts, so you can get it that way as well. We're also going to place this on our YouTube channel if you want to actually see the interview and um, watch it as opposed to just listening. I know some people will be running and jogging and running errands or driving and they'll just put it in as a podcast, but some people might actually have the inclination to sit down and watch it. And so you can. 
Um, this is attorney Linda Klein. She is the first woman president of the State Bar of Georgia, definitely a trailblazer. This is our She Was the First Conversations with Women Trailblazer series. And I will end with what else? A quote, right? So this time I'm quoting Dolly Parton. And Dolly Parton is quoted as having said, if you don't like the road you're walking, just start paving another one. And that is the example that we have. And attorney Linda Klein, thank you so much for coming by. And until next time, this has been the She's Got Gall podcast brought to you by the Georgia Association for Women Lawyers. Take care.